Well, good morning and welcome to Now Then Alliance. If I haven't met you before, my name is Nate Kemper. I'm the lead pastor here and love that we gather together each week to worship God. We're going to do that in a few different ways this morning. We'll begin here in a moment by singing our praises to God as Pastor Nathan and Janet lead us in that this morning. And then we'll have a time of uh, talking about some of the different ways that we can connect with each other, grow in our own relationship God, with God and uh, participate in what God's doing in our lives and in the world around us. We do those things because we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ. And we believe those things, connecting, growing, and participating are ways that we can do that best. And so I'm excited for us to hear about some opportunities to do that and then to continue worshiping God in song and by giving back to him some of what he's blessed us with. And then ultimately we'll end up also studying God's word together and looking at what God says uh, about what it's like to surrender to him in prayer. Last week we talked about uh, praying confession kinds of prayers to God, and today we'll talk about surrendering to God and the, the importance that Scripture says that that is for us in our lives as we are in rhythm with Him. We're excited about all of those ways. I'm hoping you're here and ready to, to worship God with us. I'm hoping you're here ready to hear from God as He would speak to us as we glorify Him as well. Before we begin that worship, I'd love for us to pray together. Would you join me in that prayer? God, we're thankful uh, that we have the opportunity to be here, whether whether physically in person or, or digitally engaging uh, this morning, we pray uh, that we would do so with a focus on you, and that we would be reminded of your goodness, that we would uh, confess that we don't deserve this, but we're thankful for the grace that you extend to us to, to put us in your presence and bring us into right relationship with you through Christ. And pray that as we celebrate that, as we worship who you are, as we listen to how you may be moving uh, this morning and throughout our days, that, that it would be foundational in preparing us to be the people you long for us to be. We know that happens because you're consistently at work in our life, and so we pray we would be open to however you would choose to do that this morning, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, would you stand with me as we begin to worship God together? This first, this first song is a, uh, is a prayer um, asking the Holy Spirit to fill us and indwell us as we sing, and there's a line that says, Holy Spirit from creation's birth giving life to all that God has made. And, and it's possible that, I know, I know this is true in many times in my life, that I've either I've given myself to things that, are, that don't give me life. And so, so I encourage you, as you sing this song, to, to ask God to reveal those things that are not of him, surrender those things to him, and ask for forgiveness for those things, and then find life that is found in Jesus, as you sing, all right? So empty, a dumping, and then a filling, all right? All right, here we go.
Jesus, this is what we've come here to do. Come reveal the stuff within our heart, Jesus, that needs to be surrendered to you. Reveal those things. Cleanse us and renew us. You are a God of redemption, a God that takes things that are broken and in need of, of, uh, of a newness, a need, a need of, of light and life that we haven't felt maybe for some time. So come, Jesus, and, and rid those things from us. Separate them as far as the east is from the west. And help us to find new life in you. Come fill us then, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as I said earlier, one of the things that we're hoping to do is give ourselves options to be able to connect with each other, to grow, and to participate. And a, a number of those are available if you look through your bulletin. If you're watching online, you can go to the resources tab of our website, and the bulletin is available there as well. And they'll list a, some options that I won't even talk about in ways that you can connect or be growing or participating in what God's doing. But one of the first things I want to remind us of is that it's wonderful for us to be able to connect with each other and with God through prayer. And so if you uh, find our Connect card in the bulletin and, and write a prayer request on the back of that, the staff, elders, and uh, many from our congregation would love to join you in praying. You can do the same thing by filling out the contact form on our website and letting us know maybe there's things that you want to celebrate that God has recently done in your life, or maybe there's things you're hoping to see God do in your life, and we'd love to join you in praying for those kinds of things together. Uh, some other opportunities that are coming up throughout the week, this coming Thursday, 
Thursday, our prime timers are hosting an event where Doug Oman is coming and giving a virtual photography tour. It's one of the most popular and enjoyable events that they do every year. And so I'd encourage you to come this Thursday at one o'clock in the sanctuary here. It'll be a great time of connecting with others and learning about some unique parts of Minnesota that maybe you've never been to, or maybe you want to relive times you've been to. And it'll be a wonderful time of connecting with other people and would invite you to join us at that. Uh, we often spend part of this Sunday, the uh, second or third Sunday in January, is typically designated as Sanctity of Life Sunday. Uh, they, they generally say, as a church, try to do that at some point in January, though they often pick a date. And so you'll notice in our bulletin that we're recognizing today as Sanctity of Life Sunday, and yet we'll spend more time talking about it next week uh, when one of our community partners, the Abba Pregnancy Resource Center, now they're the Elevere Women's Center as well, uh, they'll be joining us next week to be talking about uh, some of the initiatives they have going and how we can uh, not just be focused in in concept and prayer and hope for the sanctity of life, but how we can partner with them with steps and actions towards that as well. And so we're excited to have them join us for a portion of next week's services alongside that. Uh, and then want to just remind us that I'm hoping next week a number of you will join us uh, for a planning meeting. Uh, we're going to be talking about how we do our rhythms well throughout this year, our rhythms with God, our rhythms with our family our rhythms with uh, those other believers we're in community with, as well as our impact in the world around us. And, and we're hoping that that isn't just something that takes place on Sunday mornings in sermons and, and hopeful applications, but that's something that we, we plan events around, that we do some ministry uh, around, and that we even just understand resources for our own daily lives around. And so I'm hoping next week that you'll join me in brainstorming and putting some of those kinds of things on the calendar. If you're able to do that in person, we'll be meeting here at 6 o'clock and we'll have some pizza available and then start that meeting there. Though the, if you want to join and can't be there in person, there'll end up being a live Zoom that you can join. You can find the link to that in last week's NAC E! News and we'll make it available through our Facebook page and things like that throughout this week as well if you want to join that meeting digitally. I'd encourage you beforehand to be thinking of resources or brainstorming for yourself uh, different things that may be available. I'll give a random idea. Uh, just as an idea that I've seen other families do, I haven't yet put it in practice for my own family, but I debate it occasionally, is I knew a family that every Thanksgiving as a rhythm for their family, just once a year as a rhythm of thankfulness, they would get down on the floor and lay on the ground under their dining room table with Sharpies. And they would write on the bottom of their dining room table the things that they were most thankful for that year. I saw one of those families who had been doing that for a while and suddenly the dad had become less mobile and getting down under the table to write what he was thankful for wasn't as easy. And so he stayed on his chair and wrote on the top of the table. And they thought seeing that was more fun and enjoyed that enough that that particular family now has decided every time they eat dinner together, so almost every day, they spend a portion of their family time together with permanent markers on their dining room table writing what they're thankful for. It's just a family rhythm of thankfulness that they've put into practice alongside their meals. That's not something I'm saying, hey, let's as a church all do that over the pews. That, that would look um, maybe different. That's not the intention. But that's the idea of a resource. You can just say, here's an option for your family. If you want to uh, think through different kinds of rhythms you can be putting in place and what it looks like to do family life together and orient it towards the way God may want us to be utilizing our family as well, here's a resource. You may have tons of those kinds of ideas or things that have been helpful for you. They don't have to be that weird and creative, just things that have been established. Bring those kinds of brainstorms around how we have rhythms with God, rhythms with our family, rhythms with other believers, and rhythms in the world that we hope to impact. And we'll figure out how we best equip ourselves to do that well in our lives going forward.
As we continue in worship, one of the ways many of us do that is by giving back to God some of what he's blessed us with. If you're, if you're visiting or new attending with us that we don't have any, I want you to feel any pressure or obligation to do that. But if you want to join us in giving, uh, if you're here physically, you can do that with the offering box that's in the lobby behind us. If you're uh, not ready to do that physically but still want to give, there's always ways to give digitally through our website, nowthenalliance.org. There's a Give tab there. Uh, that's an easy way for anybody to give back to God through our ministries as well. Uh, regardless of if or how you would choose to do that, we hope that we're giving uh, something, even if it's just our heart, back to God. And so I want to pray for the gifts that we would extend to him and how he would receive it as our worship. Would you join me in that prayer? And God, we're thankful for all that you've given us, most importantly, the gift of life that you've extended to us through Christ. And yet we recognize you've blessed us in many other ways as well. And so as many of us take time now to give some of that back to you, we pray that it would be pleasing and acceptable to you as an act of worship and, and that you would use our gifts, that you would use our time, that you would use our talent, that you would use all that we offer as a way to grow your kingdom and spread your love in a world that desperately needs more of it. We pray that that's reflected not just in any uh, financial gifts or time that we give, but in our hearts worship of you as well. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, would you stand with me again as we continue to sing worship to God?
Surrender. 
As we continue looking at different ways to get our lives back in rhythm with God, we've been focusing particularly on our communication with God and what it looks like to start with uh, consistent prayer and different ways that our praying to God can look. Last week we talked about confession, uh, reminding ourselves of the privilege it is to be before God, not because we deserve it, but because of what Jesus has done before us and, and that, that we don't become unaware of how it is that we've broken that relationship, that we remember and we're authentic with what it is we need to express in repentance and confession towards God that we've done uh, that's different from his desire for us. Uh, Pastor Nathan, before beginning that first song of worship, said that there's a, a part of us that is the emptying of ourselves, and then there's a filling that comes after it. And it's often that that confession is, a, is that emptying kind of process, and then we wonder what's the parts that may come after that. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, and some of what can come right after confessing to God the things that we have done wrong. Now, I've said what it will be earlier, and we were just singing about it that we would surrender ourselves to God, that we, would, that we would give over control and that we would be completely open to what God would have for us and that we would make that our desire and our hope to live out. And throughout the morning, I want to remind us of a simple question. If you're going through the 40 days of prayer devotions, you'll find this coming up on a question that one of the authors writes for a daily devo on, on Friday. Uh, if you're uh, doing the days in the order that I've been doing them, at least. This Friday on day 19, our denomination's vice president has written a devotional that asks a simple question of us. Does God have your yes no matter what? Does God have your yes no matter what? No matter what the outcome would be, no matter what the request is, no matter what the ask is, when God says it, does he have your yes? Are you completely and fully surrendered to him? As I would think back through my life and my family and, and we would journey parts of our story, it's that kind of answering to that kind of question that dictates some of the most significant moments of our life where we've not just asked it of ourselves, but there's been hard moments or, or critical moments where we felt God put something before us and just say, so will you trust me? Do you believe that I can control this better than you can? Will you say yes to doing it my way instead of being in control of it yourself? I'd encourage you just in the moment to start thinking through not not what you hope your answer would be, but authentically, what is your answer right now? Just as we begin this morning, where you're at in your current understanding of your relationship with God, with the rhythms you have with him, is that an easy yes? Is it a hard yes? Is it, is it a depends on what you're actually asking me to do? Yes or no? I can understand that. In Genesis chapter 22, we see God ask this kind of question, not just a blunt, do I have your yes, but he puts out a, a, a test before Abraham, a test that many of us look at and say, I, I don't know that I could answer that question the same way. It says this as that story begins, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and here I am, he replied. And God's in this conversation. He's beginning to have this relationship with Abraham. He's called him to be the leader of his people. He's blessed him and Sarah with the son they've been waiting for. And at the end of that time, as, as life has continued to go forward, and Abraham has been raising Isaac to be the promised child God has said that he would send to him, this is what God says in verse 2. And God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. That's a hard thing to say yes to. God looks at Abraham and says, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and sacrifice him 
as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. And Abraham is faced with the question, does God have my yes no matter what? What would you willingly do if God has commanded it of you and asked it of you? How completely surrendered are you to God because of your relationship and your rhythms with him? Or how much control do you feel you have to have over your own life? A famous uh, Christian author, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, wrote a book called uh, When Christ Calls a Man, He Bids Him Come and Die. And as he's writing in this book, he's telling a story, at least a, a, a fabled story of Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great in the 320s BC was conquering Asia Minor, he was traveling with a small company of soldiers to a place that he had yet not conquered. And he gets there, and it's a fortified city. So Alexander the Great and his company of soldiers uh, make a formation out just outside the city gate, and he just begins to yell out to the gatekeeper, I want to meet with your king. Bring your king to come and talk to me. And the king makes his way to the city gates and asks Alexander what it is that he needs. And he says, I, I need you to surrender. We're going to take over this land and your city. And the king in his fortified walls, almost laughingly at Alexander the Great, says, why would I do that? We're in a fortified position. You have a small company of soldiers with you. There's no way you could advance into and defeat our stronghold. It just wouldn't happen. And Alexander, as the story is told, decides to put on a display. And so he turns to his small company of soldiers commands them to get in a new formation. It ends up being a single file line and to begin marching towards a cliff. And they get in line and they just begin marching at Alexander the Great's orders towards the cliff until the first man has walked himself fully off of the cliff, as has the second and third and fourth, until about 10 men, the story goes, have just walked themselves to death off the edge of a cliff. Alexander commands them to stop, to come back behind him, and to get in formation again. And the other king, watching this happen, says if, if they would willingly sacrifice their lives for this man, there's no way they aren't more resolved to win this battle than my soldiers would ever be. And so he surrendered his city to Alexander the Great and his company of soldiers. Surrender. We might see it as the, the giving over of the thing that's yours like the king does. You might see it as the willingness to do whatever your commander has asked you like Alexander the Great's men did. But either way we think of it, there's this giving up of control. A uh, different uh, commentator I was reading this week said that there's a subtle but important difference between making a commitment towards something and surrendering to something. You can make a commitment to do any kind of noble thing you want. You can make a commitment to read God's word every day. You can make a commitment that you'll, you'll always do what he says. You can make a commitment to go to the gym and lose weight. Many people made commitments over the New Year's time. That's a common time of year for people to do that. And yet a commitment still implies that we will do something within our own control. That we are in charge and that we get to dictate the terms. Surrender is allowing somebody else to be in control and dictate the terms. You give up control. And when we're honest, at least when I'm honest, it's that control piece that's really hard to give up. And so when God says to Abraham, Take your son, your only son whom you love, and give him to me as a burnt offering. There's a part of us, me as a father for sure, that shrivels back and says, why would I ever give up what I love so deeply? 
to the one who created it, to the one who gave it to me, the one who blessed me with it, the one who promised it. And yet there's this just discord of, I, I don't know that I could do that. I don't know that I could give up control. I'll be honest, it's for me not even about the big things. It's not even if somebody's asking me to give up my daughter or my wife or, or other relationships I have. At the simplest of versions, I don't want to even give up control of my car. I don't mean like give my car away. That maybe I could do at some point. I mean, if you and I are going to go somewhere together, I likely want to drive because I want to be in control. <laughs> There's a sense in which there's a comfort in knowing how my actions are going to dictate things and just surrendering myself to a passenger seat leaves somebody else in charge of those things. And that at times is uncomfortable for me. I don't know that it's always because I'm a control addict. Maybe it's sometimes because I get motion sickness, but I don't want to even give up control as something as small as driving at times. And yet, scripture's hope is that we'd be willing to give up control of everything that we'd surrender all of it to god uh, jesus says as much in, in matthew chapter 16 in matthew chapter 16 jesus is uh, talking to his disciples and it's nearing the end of his time of ministry with them and he's telling them of what's to come Partially, he's telling them of his own surrender to God's will. And this is what he says in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day to be raised to life. Jesus is essentially saying, in my surrendering to what the Father has asked of me, I know I have to go through a hard, suffering process that's going to cost me my life. And yet I'm surrendered to that. I've given up control. I am willing to say yes to whatever the Father has asked me to say yes to. It wasn't easy. You can look at his prayers in the garden and see that. He's consistently saying in those prayers to God, God, if there's another way, if this cup could pass for me, if I don't have to do this, if there's any other way, can we do that? But whatever you want, whatever your will is, that's what I'll do. You have my yes, no matter what the outcome is. And Jesus says, I, I surrender to you. We're not going to read, or I'm not going to put the next couple of verses on the screen, but, but I just want to remind you of what happens. As, as Jesus says, I'm saying yes to God, I'm surrendering to God, I'm willing to walk through even the suffering that's before me, if that's what God wants. Peter and the disciples have a very different response to that. There's a control they want to take. And so instead, verse 22, Peter said, took him inside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this should never happen to you. I won't let it happen to you. We can change this. You don't have to suffer. You won't have have to die this doesn't have to happen and Jesus turned and said to Peter get behind me Satan you are a stumbling block to me you do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns I say yes to God no matter what even if we would write the story a different way, even if we would fight valiantly and nobly a different way, I'm surrendered to what God wants no matter what, and you're putting a stumbling block in front of that. And then moving it from himself, Jesus talks about his disciples. Let's focus on this one together. In verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You need to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. You release control. It goes on, it won't come up on the screen, but it goes on to say, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. 
What good is, will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for the soul? If you want to do it well, it looks like surrendering yourself completely and fully to God. Giving all of it over to him. Author and pastor Kyle Eidelman in his book, Not a Fan, uh, says it this way. The reason Jesus is so adamant about followers surrendering everything is because the reality is this. The one thing we're most reluctant to give up is the one thing that has the most potential to become a substitute for him. Really what we're talking about here is idolatry. When we are to be following Jesus who is ahead of us, but we find ourselves looking behind us, we're revealing that we're substituting something or someone for him. And when we finally surrender that one thing, we discover satisfaction that comes from following Jesus that was always missing when we were holding something back. The question comes again, does God have our yes no matter what? Are we willing to give it all over him? Are we willing to surrender it all and let him have control of it? Are we willing to release control? ourselves. Now what I would argue is that scripture doesn't just talk about this as if it's a choice of us saying uh, we're either going to be in control or we're going to let God be in control. Scripture doesn't paint those as our two options. It actually paints the options different than that. It says essentially that there's two but the options it gives isn't about if it's God or if it's us. It says it a little different. This is Paul writing in Romans chapter 6. He says it this way. Starting in verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you're a slave of the one you obey? Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey the heart pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Essentially, what Paul says is, you're not making the choice based on if you're in control or God's in control. You're making the choice based on if you're going to be a slave to the sins of your life or a slave to the righteousness that's offered through God. The choice isn't your control or God's control. The choice is sin ruling your life or God ruling your life. That's the decision we're making. And God says, and Jesus says, we, we need to deny ourselves. We need to, to deny our flesh. We need to uh, stop being a slave to the sin nature that we have and instead surrender ourselves and take up our cross completely following God. That's his hope for us. That's what he longs for us to do in our life and relationship with him. That we would leave being slaves to sin. And that we would become slaves to righteousness. And we often don't like that word. It's had awful historical context, so I'm aware of why we shouldn't like that word. And yet it's what Paul calls us to. A slave to righteousness. He doesn't say you used to be slaves to sin and now you've worked hard enough to have earned righteousness. No, we give ourselves over completely to what God would have for us by surrendering control. He says it just a couple of chapters later a different way. Instead of just the negative context, he puts it in the more positive light. Here's what it would look like. Here's what we can do individually and corporately together. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Where it can be a harsh to hear it as surrender everything, give up everything, sacrifice it all, become a slave. Paul can say it more in the positive reference. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. That's your true and proper worship. 
give yourself over completely to God. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. I referenced it earlier, but that's what it sounds like. Jesus is praying in the garden. God, I don't know that this is what I would choose. I wouldn't necessarily write this story this way. I wish there was a different plan, but I'm here to go through whatever you have for me to go through. I'm offering myself as a living sacrifice to you. When I was in my early 20s, I took a missions trip to Vietnam and we smuggled some Bibles in uh, to the persecuted church there. Things that uh, if we had gotten caught with them, as a couple of our, our group did, it says uh, you get a black mark on your visa and passport and can't come in back into the country for 90 days. If the Vietnamese pastor gets caught with them, he likely dies. And so we had brought the Bibles in. We had waited a couple of days to make sure we weren't being followed. And then we met a Vietnamese pastor in a secluded location out in the wilderness to give him the Bibles. And we got to communicate with him through translators. And I remember while sitting in a, a circle eating lunch with him, one of the students that was with me just asked him, uh, asked the pastor, well, what's your favorite verse in scripture? What verse is most meaningful to you? And he quoted Romans 12:1 offering myself as a living sacrifice. It says every day, that's what it feels like to be a pastor here. The risk is knowing that the moment the government finds out what I'm doing, my life goes from a living sacrifice to a dead sacrifice. That's the reality. And yet I see that that's what God's call is, that that's my true and proper worship. Isn't just when we've gathered to sing, isn't just what we do when we study God's word. It's the constant looking at God and saying, you have my yes no matter what. Does God have your yes no matter what? Do you offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to him? I know that it's hard. Like I said, there's lots of things in my life I don't want to give control of. Uh, there's lots of questions that God would ask that I think, well, I see that he asked it of Abraham. But that's really an unfair question, right? Like God wouldn't really ask me to do that. So I don't know what I would have to say, or I don't even have to think what I would say if God asked me the yet. And so the question then becomes, well, what is, what is it that I might need to surrender? Or as Kyle Eidelman will have said it, what is it that I'm looking back at while I'm supposed to be following Christ who's in front of me? What has the potential to become an idol in my life? Oh, whether that's the big thing or the small thing, what are the kinds of things that when God says we should surrender him or we should be a slave to righteousness instead of a slave to sin, what are the practical implications of that in my life? As I would confess to God what has been true and then, and then what to pray prayers of surrender to him, what are the things I would be surrendering back to God that I may have kept part, partial control of in my life? I'll give us a few examples. There's times that I need to surrender control of my desires because many of my de desires are still slaves to sin instead of to righteousness. There's things I long for in this world that have nothing to do with what God hopes for me or has asked of me. Sometimes that looks like greed. Sometimes that looks like lust. Sometimes that looks like laziness. That there's a surrendering of some of my own desires and control of my, my hopes and attitudes and behaviors that I need to give back to God. That I need to surrender and let go of. Sometimes I need to surrender other noble things because they've had the potential to become an idol, the a family. My own works towards righteousness, a reputation relationships that I need to surrender and say, God, I've held these things so closely and in such control that they're a conflicted yes or a questioned yes instead of a easy yes. And I want to surrender those things to you. God, I want you to be in control of those things in a way that you'll do far better than I would ever do. 
true because of my upbringing and because of the country I live in and because of my access to lots of kinds of different resources and networks. I often need to surrender my stability. We see that happen. God asks that of people in scripture. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what is it I need to do? And Jesus says, you need to go sell everything and give it to the poor. Because he had found his worth, his stability, his confidence is found in things instead of a relationship with God. And God sees that and says, that's what you might need to surrender and let go of. My hope is that if uh, God would say that to me, I would say yes. My hope even more is that I'd be willing to surrender that kind of stuff in my heart to God before he ever has to ask it of me in the practice the way he did of the rich young ruler. I need to surrender my, my opinion. I need to surrender my past. We see at times God say to the people in the wilderness, you need to stop looking back to Egypt and what you used to have and pretending it's going to be that way again. He says it later to Daniel. You need to stop looking back to Jerusalem and the things you had and the way the people of God lived and worshipped together. You're not going back there. It's going to look different. You need to stop looking back to a picture of what church and community and worship looked like a year ago. Because we don't know that it'll ever quite get back to that. And our job is to be in surrender to God as he's in control. And what it looks like for us to do life corporately and individually with him well now. Not just to return to what it used to look like. Are we willing to just say, yes, God, I surrender my hopes and dreams and desires of what those things would look like. And instead, I'm asking the question, God, what do you have for me or for us to be doing with our lives now in worship of you? Do we give up control and do we surrender or do we just simply say, no, I'm going to make it look the way I've wanted it to look. I'm in control of this. Does God have our yes? Here's what I think it looks like then in our lives. First, I would hope it looks like prayer. That as we would pray to God, confessing some of the things we would done wrong, we would, we would follow that up with a surrendering of the control to even try to figure it out the right way on our own. That we would give God a blanket yes. That the things that we would recognize we've done wrong, we wouldn't just say, God, I've done them wrong and hope not to do them wrong again. But God, I've done them wrong and I want to surrender even the desire of those things over to you. I recognize there was a reason I still chose to do those things wrong and I don't want that anymore. I want to surrender that part of my life back to you. I want to offer it to you as a living sacrifice. Not just a confession of the past, but a living sacrifice saying, I'll, I'll deal with the consequences, the fire, the suffering, the persecution, the uh, potential death, Jesus says. I'll deal with the consequences, but I want to offer this to you as a living sacrifice. And so for many of us, it will look like daily acts of prayer, of reminding ourselves and, and letting God know he has our yes no matter what. At other times, it may be worthwhile to have a moment where we maybe do that in a more blunt way than just daily prayer. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, at one point was asked what was most significant in his life. How was he able to do the things he was able to accomplish with, with the ministry that he's overseen and, and started? And, and he, in interviews, would say, well, it always started with a, a complete surrendering of myself to God. Before I had a vision or a dream for a ministry like Campus Crusade for Christ, my wife and I just wanted to surrender our lives as completely to God as we could. And so there was a turning point on a day where we decided to do that by literally writing a contract with God. We wrote out and signed a contract with God. Here's what he wrote. Bill Bright and his wife of Campus Crusade for Christ wrote this contract to God. From this day, Lord, we surrender and we relinquish all of our past, present, and future rights and material possessions to you. 
as an act of the will and by faith we choose to become your bond slaves and to do whatever you want us to do, to go wherever you want us to go, to say whatever you want us to say, no matter what it costs for the rest of our lives. With your help, we will never again seek the praise or applause of men or the material wealth of the world. They wrote a contract. They signed it. They reference it, not just as a thing they wrote on a piece of paper and signed and shoved in a drawer somewhere, but as a substantial reminder to themselves in that moment and then for every moment going forward that they would be in complete surrender to God. Paul says, I'll remind us in Romans 12, 1, to offer ourselves our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. For Bill Bright and his wife, it looked like this prayer, written and offered to God and signed on one day, but prayed every day since. We surrender and relinquish all of our past, present, and future rights and material possessions to you as an act of the will, and by faith we choose to become your bond slaves and do whatever you want us to do, go wherever you want us to go, say whatever you want us to say, no matter what it costs for the rest of our lives. And we'll never again seek the praise or applause of men and the material wealth of the world a living sacrifice, a surrender, a prayer to God, and a reminder of who's really in control. My hope is that when we're aiming to get our life in rhythm with God, we would recognize it doesn't just look like some spiritual disciplines of formulaic prayer and Bible reading. Those are helpful, and we'll continue to talk about them. But it looks like confession repentance and surrender daily surrender does God have your yes my hope is that we don't just hear these things and and feel like that's a challenging question but that we have opportunity uh, to put those things into practice and so my hope is that you'd pick away I don't know what your one way will be this week. If God reveals one to you, I would encourage you to do whatever it is he says. But if you're looking for something you can put into practice this week around our values of connecting, growing, and participating, I want to give you some options. If you're looking this week to, to put this message into practice, to surrender in practice, and you're looking to do so while connecting with another person, it just may look like a conversation where you ask someone what it means to them to deny themselves and pick up their cross. What does that mean when Jesus says that that's what his disciples should do, that we should deny ourselves and pick up our cross? What's that practically look like in someone's life? And then have a conversation about it. It doesn't have to turn into some awesome surrender or weird uh, moment. Just saying, what does that even mean when Jesus says that? And have that in conversation with a fellow believer. If you're looking instead to do something that will grow you in your relationship with God, maybe a different kind of spiritual discipline you can do personally, Why don't you try to physically write out Romans chapter 12, verse 1 every day? To just physically write it down. What Paul says there about offering our bodies as living sacrifices. And every day this week, for seven days, you'll just take pen or pencil and paper and physically write it. I imagine if you'll do that by the end of the week, you'll probably have it memorized, which is a good biblical spiritual practice as well. But... Something just to remind yourself every day what your true and proper worship would be. Write out Romans 12, chapter 1. Or if instead you were looking to participate in what God is doing in your life and the world around you, it might look like Bill Bright and his wife did. To write a contract of surrender to God. If you Google some of those, you can see some other options. When I found the story of Bill Bright, it came alongside uh, an author and blogger who had written his own version of a contract to God then. So you can see other examples of language on what it looks like to just give up control and offer to God in contract your consistent yes. Maybe that will be important and valuable to you.
I, I don't know what you may choose to do. I don't care if it's one of those three things or something else, but my hope is you, you wouldn't just decide that you've heard a message and it was challenging and you agree that surrender is uh, biblical and valuable and important, but that we would, we would do something with it. And so as we go, that would be my hope, that we would go in full surrender to God. Uh, I'm going to close with words from a, a hymn. It's a hymn called Fully Surrendered. It's not a hymn I think I've ever sung before or known, but it's another one that you'll find uh, quoted if you look through the daily devotions this week. Uh, just a verse from the hymn Fully Surrendered by Alfred Sneed. Fully surrendered, Lord, I am thine. Fully surrendered, Savior divine. Live thou thy life in me. All fullness dwells in thee, not I, but Christ in me. God, we pray that we would be a people who are fully surrendered to you. That we would recognize that that, that, will, that will mean more about our rhythm and our relationship with you than, than almost any other spiritual discipline we could put in place. That if you would have our unquestioned yes, if we would give over everything to you every day, that we would say yes to you in prayer. That we'd say yes to you in every question that you would ask, that we would release control of our own lives and offer it back to you as slaves to righteousness. That that's the rhythm and hope you would have for us, that we would be living sacrifices, living life in step with the Spirit. And so we pray that we would do that that you would work in and through us and show us the value and the fruit that comes from that so that each day as we do that, that yes becomes easier and easier as you outpour your spirit more powerfully in and through us. We pray it, asking it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go, I hope you go in grace. I hope you go in peace. I hope you go fully surrendered to what God may have for you today and every day following, you are dismissed.